Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. It is my distinct pleasure today to be able to introduce you to Dr. Jahar Ali, who is a colleague here at the International Rights Research Institute based in Los Banos in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, received his bachelor's degree from Punjab Agricultural University and his MSc and PhD from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. And after working for some years in other projects, he has joined IRI to work for the IRI Iran project in 2003. And since 2009 uh, until today, uh, he has been working with us here in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Ali is going to uh, give you a rundown on everything related to hybrid rice seed production. So everything that you always wanted to know about that subject, but were afraid to ask for, will be revealed to, to today. And I yield the floor and the presentation to Dr. Ali. Go ahead, Jahar. Thank you, uh, Marco, for the nice introduction. Uh, can you see my slide before I get into the... Yes, but oh. can you put it in full screen mode? Yes, <laughs> okay. In presentation mode, yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, uh, good day to all of you from whichever part of the world you are from. Uh, and uh, this is a very important uh, topic uh, and a very hot topic uh, these days. So, uh, I welcome all of you to this... Uh, webinar today, a brief one, but it will take uh, somewhat uh, one and a half hours of uh, talking time and then 30 minutes for discussion. So without losing any time, I would just uh, get into the thing. So this webinar talk I have dedicated to Dr. Uh, Professor Yuan Longpin, the father of hybrid rice. And I know, I think no one uh, in the world, uh, other all the hybrid rice and rice colleagues uh, definitely know this great personality who lived uh, until May 2021. And the man who really dreamt a rice tree, uh, that's how uh, one can say. So he's such a great personality who, who was the chief architect of the hybrid rice technology uh, as such. So, uh, and Today's uh, webinar, uh, I tried to summarize what are the expectations from those expectations you had sent on hybridized seed production. Uh, to understand the basics of uh, hybridized seed production was the most common one. How to practically utilize uh, new innovations in uh, seed production. Somebody said how to uh, benefit from, uh, to maximize the uh, hybridized seed yields and to also know technical aspects of hybridized seed production. And a few were on the policy make, uh, what on the policy fronts and uh, other strategies that uh, uh, we are talking about. So I will try to cover most of this. this the primary reason here is, this is actually a, a training course which we gave for two weeks time uh, in many countries. Uh, and ERI has its own uh, hybridized seed production training course for three days period and can be, uh, uh, can be taken to any country that we want. And uh, in these three days, uh, both practical and uh, theory is given in more detail, but the, the flow of the content would be similar. Okay, so uh, those who are well aware of this uh, should not find it difficult to going through this. So I will try to uh, uh, go through the introduction, emphasizing the need, uh, current status, then floral parts, uh, what are the features of the AVNR, uh, ideal season location, nursery management, main field management, row ratio, uh, direction, uh, transplanting, ANR, fertilizer and irrigation scheduling, prediction of heading date, adjustment methods, criteria for good flowering synchronization, role and advantages of gibberellic acid and method of application, supplementary pollination, how roguing is important. I will not be touching on disease and pest, uh, but I will uh, just uh, try to touch that, uh, what to be done. And then post harvest seed management, uh, including the harvesting, seed processing, uh, then seed certification and standards and genetic purity and economics. 
And while uh, ending up, I'll try to, uh, some of the key points I would emphasize for a very successful seed production. So this uh, course is primarily targeting undergrad students, technicians, uh, the seed growers, uh, or those who would like to know something about hybridized seed production. So uh, I would like to also take this opportunity to give you some details on the HRDC objectives. Uh, one of the part of this objective uh, is also to reach out to create public awareness and capacity building. That's what this talk is all about. And uh, the, the, the other thing uh, uh, I would suggest that the support of uh, research in developing parental lines to meet market requirements of hybrids, organize multi-location uh, replicated yield trials, to provide better information on performance of hybrids and best practices. So all this is also done as part of the objectives. Uh, for more details on the membership and other details, please visit this website. Currently our membership is about uh, 93 uh, in total. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, 93 members out of which uh, about uh, a large number from uh, the green members with uh, in, in, uh, most of the Norris members, 53. And uh, we have uh, uh, 38 members from private sector, the paid members. And we had impressive growth of 36.8% from 2016 onwards. So, Now let us get to the, uh, the, the real uh, uh, webinar is all about. So first we'd like to know uh, what is uh, uh, like, what we would like to, or where, where we would like to reach in by 2027. So keeping this a few years back, I was trying to uh, extrapolate uh, what could be the trajectories uh, around hybrid rice adoption and uh, outside, especially outside China. China, we very well know about 16 million hectares uh, is the current uh, area under ch in China, but outside China is touching around 9 million hectares currently uh, based on our best estimates. And so from here, how far we can we reach by 2027? If nothing is done, then possibly uh, uh, we will end up in uh, somewhere in the lowest curve uh, Uh, in the lowest uh, of these trajectories, uh, that is uh, somewhere um, would touch something like 11 or maybe 10 million hectares. But if we do something just like the red one, uh, production side interventions, then we may follow the red curve. Uh, or if we do uh, the, the market orientation uh, uh, kind of approach, which is currently being followed, so we'll have a trajectory of the green one. And the purple one is we put all our efforts in the best manner, in the best situation, then we can see something like a purple one on the top. So I would uh, be very uh, conservative here and think if we, even if we touch this green bar in a very precise manner, we should be very good. Uh, even touch 14 million hectares should be good enough for outside China in, in next, uh, this many, in by 2027. Now, what could be the drivers for this uh, creating those impact? Number one is the superior parental lines. And this is where it is focusing its all its efforts to create that superior parental lines, especially in a genomic era where genomic selection tools are being used, heterotic pool driven uh, breeding is done. And eventually uh, we will be able to create the best situation uh, for the uh, the parental lines. And this was being shared under the HRDC membership. People can avail it and they will run the race, not ERI competing with the system. So eventually uh, ERI would like to see itself positioned that the, 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 our collaborators uh, reach higher grounds and try to lead the way. Whereas we will be supplying them with the requisite uh, materials in order to achieve that. The second major thing is the heterotic hybrids. Can we go beyond 30% of yield advantage? Currently, 20 to 25% is observed in thing. Even in our uh, uh, recent surveys, we see about 30% uh, in, uh, in target regions in Philippines. 
is about uh, in 500 uh, farmers uh, data, we saw that it is about 30% uh, with hybrids compared with inbreds, best inbreds. And then the key to this is higher seed reproducibility of those hybrids. It doesn't matter how good you see your hybrid, but how much uh, it can produce that combination is the key element out there. And if we can cross uh, three tons beyond, uh, that is the, uh, the benchmark that we have put in our uh, market uh, uh, requirements. And then multiple stress tolerant hybrids is going to be the future because the climate stress is not going to leave us uh, in the next few decades. It will become more rampant, uh, rampant with the, uh, the flooding, sal uh, the salinization, the, the drought uh, spells will be more. Now, market preferred grain quality and nutritious hybrids is our uh, the uh, core of the breeding program. Uh, and we are totally trying to make sure that the parental lines that we develop uh, addresses those uh, market required uh, grain quality as well as uh, the nutritious uh, hybrids. Likewise, uh, when I say nutritious hybrid, we are, we are meaning here is zinc and uh, iron, uh, which are the, uh, the most important elements that need to be also inbuilt in the program. HRDC efforts is one way of infusing the materials. More uh, materials are going to be infused in the coming uh, uh, decade and public and private engagements and investments. This is very, very important uh, that people should not shy away. The policymakers should not shy away from investments. This is a technology which is a short technology that can lift 25 to 30% yield advantage over the input thereby increasing the production in the same proportion. So uh, it, it all depends on how you plan and how you leverage all the public and private engagements in the country, uh, wherever you come from and how you invest on it. Recently, Nepal was one very glaring example where they took a very big uh, step in uh, joining the uh, hybridize in a big way. And uh, I would really commend their policymakers uh, in this uh, particular webinar that, uh, that they have understood that the, the hybrid technology is a very, very solid approach to uh, ensure their food security, especially in the coming decades when food would, be, uh, would not be so easily available, especially with these all kind of uh, situations that we are coming across, especially under COVID and uh, the climate uh, climate uh, uh, stresses. Now, uh, this, the, the very purpose of this is also to sensitize the policy and decision makers towards hybridized technology. And we need the elements with them that makes them strengthened to adopt the hybridized technology in a big way and make uh, other countries uh, to feel safer and secure as we move along with the big target of achieving uh, to feed almost uh, 10 billion people by uh, 2050. And this is not going to be easy when we are going to suppose to uh, increase our food productivity by another 60% of what we are currently producing. And the hybrid technology is one such approach uh, where uh, we need to adopt and see how best we can uh, bring it to the best uh, situation. Now, the, the other important thing uh, to begin with is historical resume, uh, because anything that we like to uh, address here is, uh, I tried to uh, bring this uh, historical resume up to 1994, but uh, uh, after 1994 onwards, it, it, the, the story is all known, people know about it, but the initial uh, term called heterosis was first coined by Shull, 1926, uh, Jones found heterosis in uh, rice. Uh, Ramaya in the same year uh, discovered male sterility. Uh, in 55, uh, again, Sampat and Mohanty reported male sterility uh, uh, from uh, uh, NRRI currently, uh, previously known as Central Rice Research Institute. And uh, 1970, the discovery of the WA cytoplasm or the wild abortive cytoplasm uh, was discovered uh, in Hainan Island uh, by the Professor Yong Long Pins uh, team. You can see the wild rice spontaneous in this uh, where in Hainan Island, and it was how it was discovered is another big uh, story there. 
uh, and that is how the whole technology eventually came. Uh, one very interesting uh, 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 reference I came uh, across, and I think many of you might have come across, is 1971 IRC uh, uh, proceedings. If you get into this, uh, many uh, cha three chapters, especially India, Erie, and US uh, also were there uh, that proposed the hybridized in this uh, thing, hybridized technology. What are the prospects of hybridized? So that early people uh, understood the importance of this. By 1976, Chinese uh, scientists, especially led by Professor Yuan Longpin, brought in the A, B, and R lines uh, and uh, uh, developed the commercial uh, hybrid technology to the world. And this is, uh, and then there was no turnaround. By 1981 uh, or 82, uh, the, the initial materials started flowing to Erie. By 88, uh, Erie also developed its own CMS line using those uh, materials that were received from China. And by 1994, India could release its first commercial hybrids, Andhra Pradesh uh, hybrid rice one, uh, and then history was created. And then ever since from that time, from 1994 till now, we have reached about uh, uh, comfortably around uh, 4 million hectares in India. Uh, currently, what is being uh, felt that it should be, it is around 3.5, but I put up another 0.5 million hectare because many of these are not reported in a proper way. What we know, big chunks, we report it at 3.5, but uh, around 4 million is estimated at this time in India alone. And outside China, it touches around 9 million when you put uh, many of these countries together in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the hybridized technology, why there is a need uh, for the students, especially those who are uh, attending this uh, seminar, uh, this webinar, is uh, rice farming itself need to, uh, uh, has to be sustained. Uh, and if you increase the productivity uh, and it makes it more profitable, then the rice farmers would continue rice farming itself. So there is a very important uh, issue out here when uh, you cultivate an inbred variety, you are going to get about 150 US dollars of revenue uh, by cultivating one hectare uh, in more or less in many parts of the world. Uh, some places can touch $200, but that is a very small amount of money to keep it uh, running. So in order to get that uh, yield advantage of one ton, so there can be an additional income uh, for the farmers. Attaining self-sufficiency in countries where like Nepal in this case has to achieve through uh, hybrid technology, which is very feasible. When you don't have geographical area to cultivate more rice, this is the best approach is to adopt hybrid rice technology because you can vertically increase without horizontally expanding over area. And then it is secures the future, especially for your populations, wherever you are, it's a very good uh, approach to address the food security directly. It also generates uh, rural employment today. Uh, 85 to 90% of the seed production is done in Telangana region alone in India of the entire uh, 4 million hectares of hybrids. You can imagine how many people are benefited from this uh, uh, rural employment. And it has created a very uh, good uh, 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 model to people to adopt it. Seed industry can be developed around it. And so it was the case when APR, uh, the Andhra Pradesh rice hybrid in 1994, when it was done it was in Telangana, some of these places, it was with very humble one hectare, a half hectare uh, plots. And eventually you imagine how much of seed production is done in this particular region alone is very, very uh, important that how a big seed industry today, all the major companies, seed hybrid seed companies sitting in Hyderabad. Less dependence on rice imports, especially highly fluctuating international prices. Uh, there can be, uh, if you have your own rice, you don't need to import. And that is the key. And you don't need to, uh, because of the high fluctuating rice prices, uh, especially uh, because the, the food that is transaction, the rice that is transacted is between 25 million to 35 million tons uh, as compared to wheat and other commodities like food it is more than uh, 100 million hectares, so 100 million tons. So therefore, uh, you have to always uh, keep your uh, rice import secure uh, in, in terms of uh, you be self-sufficient rather not import it. 
So hyperdrive technology is the best alternative among all the things. I put it in bold just to put uh, this into one's mind that hyperdrive's current yield advantages are between 20 to 25 percent. Uh, you imagine if you are going to cultivate this uh, with inbreds, you need 20 to 25 percent more area in order to achieve what you are achieving uh, out of this uh, 9 million hectares. So you need another 20 to 25 percent area if you have to produce uh, the same uh, yield and levels uh, as that of the inbreds. So therefore, we have to uh, uh, we have to see how much it saves on the chemical inputs the labor, the water, the everything is saved 20 to 25%. So this is the key equation that people have to understand. And poor uh, farmers in rain fed cannot afford for costly chemical inputs. And a very good example is that a hybrid technology has taken off very well in the favorable rain fed conditions in India, especially in Chhattisgarh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, and uh, uh, the Bihar provinces, you can see hybridized technology has taken deeper roots in that. And many of these places, even in the favorable rain fed areas, hybrid technology has prevailed. Yield and quality can be combined. People always argue that the grain quality is one thing that it will look like uh, Chinese uh, type of sticking, uh, sticky type of rices, uh, uh, but uh, that is a uh, consumer preferred thing. So in China and Japan and other places, they prefer stickiness. But when you come to the Indian subcontinent or in this part of the world, then people love the uh, flakiness and the long grain, uh, long slender grain. So therefore, we can create any kind of hybrid uh, uh, of any type of grain quality with the current uh, technology that we have. And we, we have to only match the parental lines in the same range because F2 is basically what is the parental range. So if you both the parents are having similar uh, grain quality, automatically your hybrid would end up in the same situation. So that is the uh, ball game that people have to understand those breeders who are budding uh, breeders out here, try to breed varieties that are the parental lines that are in the same parental range. And therefore you will end up in the targeted grain quality. And with the current tools, one can really benefit from it. Then we can go to the abiotic stresses like uh, it uh, also performs, hybrid performs well in saline and drought conditions as well. And uh, in this regard, uh, climate resilient rice hybrids that IRI is currently working. We have uh, all the elements in built into the current uh, uh, hybrids that we are developing. And uh, the first versions are already uh, near to uh, coming out and uh, already being tested in many places. So we'll see these type of hybrids taking uh, the way. Now, begin with the hybrid rice seed production course, uh, uh, the webinar in particular, uh, I will try to touch uh, in different uh, topics uh, and each topic would be uh, highlighted like this. So first topic is on rice floral parts and its importance. And uh, if you uh, look at this flower, uh, you have a bifid stigma uh, there, with uh, six anthers there, or we call the stamens, and the, 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 the anthers are connected with the filaments. And uh, there is a bifid stigma, which uh, uh, you can see here, and there is one uh, ovule out there. And there is one thing that people don't notice is this lodicule. And this is where I would like you to focus. This lodicule is very important from hybridized point of view because this is the one that opens up the gloom and lemma, lemma and pelia during the flowering time. So this lodicule, uh, because of its swellingness, it will open the lemma pelia. And this should not get dried up due to uh, uh, hot weather. So we have to uh, go around this lodicule how best we can help in to maintain the best uh, thing. And eventually, all this uh, revolves around the floral parts. Now, what would be the second topic is on the desirable features of AB and R lines. Among the uh, male sterile line, I think uh, there's a very good uh, book uh, on hybridized seed production. People should uh, refer to that book. All the details of the seed production is there. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, is basically that a rice line that cannot produce viable pollen uh, with the interaction between cytoplasmic and nuclear genes. I will come to that, uh, how that they interact. 
And this uh, becomes completely male sterile. And when you take the pollen uh, sample under a microscope with IKI staining of 1%, then you will see unstained, uh, shriveled, and uh, abortive cytoplasm and round, unstained uh, uh, pollen grains uh, here in the bottom. And this uh, uh, is used as the female parent in the seed production. And uh, the panicles do not emerge out completely. That is why we need uh, some chemicals to do that. I'll come to that later. And the, when you look at these uh, anthers, they are very shriveled and uh, white in color. Uh, they look as if uh, nothing is there. And uh, the flowering lasts for seven days. Uh, and in some cases, a few more days. But that is the time uh, 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 the flowering period of the, uh, the male sterile line takes. Then going to the restorer, uh, the line is completely uh, uh, fertile uh, in the sense that the pollen grains take complete stain and they're round and spherical and they take uh, complete deep stain on IKI staining and it restores the fertility of the F1 when it is crossed to a CMS line is called a restorer. Now restorer or a pollen parent or a male parent or R line uh, uh, are the alternative names that is used. Uh, whenever we say R line, we refer to restorer line. And whenever I say A line, I refer to the CMS line. And R line is used as a pollinator and CMS uh, parent for the hybridized seed production. This is what we will be talking the whole time today. The growth duration may or may not be similar to that of the CMS lines. Uh, uh, therefore, we need to match them. And that's why we will come to all those uh, techniques. Uh, panicles exert fully out of the uh, flag leaf, unlike the A line doesn't come out, but uh, the uh, R lines, the panicles exert comple completely out. The anthers are yellow and plump and shed pollen on touching them during the uh, anthesis time. The flowering lasts for five days in full bloom uh, situation. So this is the characteristic. And the, the B line is also, uh, uh, all this is there, but uh, B is called the maintainer line, which I'll come to think, and it also has a similar uh, features, but except the first one, uh, it only maintains the, uh, the CMS line. That is how we'll come to know about it and uh, the, their isocytoplasmic uh, line. So basically uh, the B line uh, would also have plumpy uh, anthers. Now in the feeding for parental lines is one of the key uh, elements at Erie we are all the time working on this particular aspect, how to increase the outcrossing rate, how to make the uh, combining ability higher in these materials. On the, uh, on the restorer side, we are trying to see how much of these anthers are dehisced outside and how much is the pollen load? How can we uh, uh, increase the uh, pollen uh, production as much as possible and dehisce outside? And uh, under the different climatic conditions, we are trying to build it in uh, different, uh, uh, tolerant uh, conditions, especially for uh, the climate resistant uh, parental backgrounds. So in the past, uh, uh, when the early generation of uh, after 5A to 5A, which was one of the historic uh, CMS line, and later uh, uh, many uh, CMS lines were developed. And among them, uh, uh, we have recently uh, given five of the uh, top performing uh, CMS line which are which, which the HRDC, which is more than 45% uh, uh, outcrossing rate. And uh, the combining ability is very high. These are already with the, uh, with the HRDC members. And uh, this is much uh, superior to what 25A currently, what people are holding or those companies who are working. Now, coming to the hybridized technology, understand you need three steps. Number one, maintenance. Now in maintenance, uh, it is uh, the male sterile line is crossed with a, a maintainer line, which is uh, called as a B line. And in the nucleus, which is in blue color, it is a recessive uh, uh, restorer gene, restorer fertility, RF means restorer fertility. So it is in recessive state. And in both the things are identical. The nucleus is identical. A and B remain the same. Only difference is the cytoplasm. Here, the cytoplasm is normal. Here, the cytoplasm is sterile. So when the first uh, CMS line was developed, 
it was taken from the, the sterile cytoplasm that came from China in the wild abortive cytoplasm uh, in the form of V20A. These lines were converted with that and the cytoplasm was backcrossed and brought into the current A lines that all over the world, 90-95% 90, 90, of the all the CMS line carry the same uh, sterile cytoplasm as that of the wild abortive cytoplasm, the same uh, wild abortive, right? So you have to understand uh, this cytoplasm was backcrossed and they produced this uh, uh, A line in the first time and then they created its pair which was not uh, crossed so that becomes its B line. Eventually, when you cross this B line with this one, uh, it produces the, again, a, 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 a sterile line. So this, when you plant it, it will be completely male sterile. So, so when you get the seed of this, you plant it in the second step uh, in uh, different rows uh, uh, proportions in the field. Uh, and this also A and B is also in uh, different row proportions. Mostly the most popular is eight rows of A line to two rows of B. Uh, even those who are very new to uh, A by R, they can start with eight rows to two rows. Once they are very specialized, then you can reach up to 16 rows to two rows uh, as shown here. So in the, uh, uh, in the restoration step, these uh, seeds are produced in a place where you are going to have an isolation. Uh, this uh, line actually shows isolation here, complete isolation uh, by space and time. And uh, the, 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 the A line out here is uh, sterile as uh, shown earlier. And then the difference here, the restored is a very distinctive uh, uh, in the nucleus, more the distinct, more the heterosis is possible. And that is why we do uh, indica japonica crosses to make the distinctiveness between the gene pools of the nucleus. So more diverse, more heterosis is possible. So in this case, the, the normal cytoplasm and the restorer gene uh, is in dominant conditions. So it gives the dominance into the F1 and this does not allow the sterile cytoplasm coming from the female because female contributes the cytoplasm to the, uh, the fertilization. So therefore the always the, uh, the, uh, the sterility gene which is located in the mitochondria uh, moves uh, to the uh, F1. And uh, though being even sterile, it does not allow uh, the RF gene does not allow, which is in dominant state, does not allow the sterility gene to express and therefore the F1 is fertile. These, these are the seeds that are given to the farmers. And once these farmers receive the seed, they grow in their field. Uh, uh, for example, you have all released hybrids in many parts of the world. Uh, and this can be grown uh, in, uh, in 18 kgs per hectare. And uh, eventually you can produce a very good food uh, for your plate, which the consumers will eat, depending on the grain quality of that hybrid. Now, the important thing here is to make this A by B, you need uh, 15 kg of A line, 5 kg of B line to do so. Again, 15 kg of A line here, another 5 kg per hectare of R line in order to achieve this seed production. And 18 kg per hectare, uh, even people use 16 kg uh, in this case. So these are changing uh, with the more modernization and the precision based tools. You can reduce the seed rate up to 16, even go below that but uh, uh, it is all depending upon one's experience. Now seed production, uh, this kind of seed production, the last, uh, the second step seed production, is what I mean by hybridized seed production. And this is where in different countries, different levels, most of the countries have now achieved uh, 2.2 2 to 2.5 tons per hectare, uh, including Vietnam and other places. Uh, and uh, almost uh, many of the countries are in this uh, range, except for Indonesia and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, other countries like Iran and other places. So if you look at the, uh, the potential yields that can be possible has been shown to 4.4 hectares, even uh, in China, many parts uh, in small plots, they have achieved up to six tons. So these are all uh, in small plots and small good stories, but uh, even if you touch uh, three tons, 
is a great achievement by all standards. Okay, so our best uh, benchmark at this point is three tons. Uh, if we can move this, your the seed uh, seed cost would come down drastically. Uh, that is the thing. Now, if you look at the hybridized seed production, it is linked to uh, female parent multiplication. Now, if you look at the uh, uh, the area of ratio of CMS multiplication to hybridized seed production to commercial F1 cultivation. Currently, uh, in many parts uh, where the technologies have been well done, uh, is uh, one, uh, if you have one hectare of uh, CMS multiplication, it can translate into 50 hectares of hybridized seed production. And if you have 50 hectares of hybridized seed production, it can translate into 5,000 hectares of uh, F1 cultivation. Likewise, the technology, two line technology, on the other hand, one hectare of uh, two line technology, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the TGMS multiplication or the male sterile uh, line multiplication, because it, uh, the multiplication rate is very high here. So it can give uh, 100 uh, uh, hectares of hybridized seed production, and it can touch 15,000 hectares of F1 cultivation. So this is the biggest advantage of two line technology. It can rapidly upscale in no time. Uh, but uh, the three line uh, is a proven technology. Two line, we are demonstrating this technology to the private, with the help of private seed industry currently. And we have got very good leads uh, making uh, it possible in the next one or two years. And uh, the progress uh, in the two line study group is enormously uh, fully validated. And in the process in next one or two years, this technology would prevail in India and in the Indian subcontinent uh, where the members are currently. Now steps in hybridized seed production. So now I go more into the detailed uh, part. Choice of, uh, the choice of uh, uh, field is very important. I think uh, I will give all the points to this, the choice. If you do not pick a place which is naturally shielded from other rice varieties or crops uh, by natural, uh, uh, barriers like trees or uh, mountains or valleys or anything like that. At the same time, the soil should be highly fertile and uh, could produce a very good uh, high yielding crop of inbred rice even in that place. That is the place you should select. So when you are able to get high yields in inbred crop without any serious pests and diseases and with good irrigation facility and drainage, that is the place you should select for seed production. So there is no hurry. You don't need to uh, worry that uh, uh, in selecting a field, but this field uh, choice of the field is the key element out here. If you do not get it right, then that is the problem. Isolation. Now you should have space isolation. I mentioned the mountainous uh, geographical situation. You can have uh, time isolation as well, but I would not recommend even time isolation uh, as, a, as an expert. Uh, that 21 days you can have minimum 21 days is required and a barrier can be erected. All those things uh, are uh, really not uh, so good as long as you can get space isolation. So highest priority should be given for space isolation. Ensure that is a big uh, area. Try to focus with one hybrid combination in that place. Row ratio, row direction and planting patterns of Parental lines, I'll talk about that in the few coming slide. Arrangement and adjustment of flowering and synchronization. Roguing, I will emphasize very much. I'll come to that later. Leaf clipping, GA3 application, supplementary pollination, and harvesting parental lines separately. I'll come one by one. Now, so let us talk about the ideal seed, ideal season and location for hybridized seed production. So if you have a trees around uh, like this in this case, uh, though I have put a barrier here, uh, minus the barrier, if you have a trees and a mountainous uh, surrounding, if I convert this entire area with one combination, uh, uh, in case of Erie, for example, that would become an ideal situation for Erie even. If I take the entire, that particular up to that mountain till this place, if I take entire into hybridized seed production, one combination, that is ideal for uh, this kind of a scenario. But again, uh, does it uh, match the season? Does it match the temperature conditions? These are very important, and this is what I'll be 
Okay. So, if fertile soils is very important. You should get high yields with uh, uh, with uh, inbred crop that is uh, just a say at least eight tons per hectare or seven tons, a high yield uh, environment, uh, yielding environment. So that whatever you get yield in seed production also translates into higher yields. Number two, the less prone to insect pests and diseases. Do not select a place which is already vulnerable, vulnerable to insect pests and diseases and you have to spend a lot of money to uh, uh, spray those things and uh, by chemical controls and your cost of production will increase. So the best thing is don't go to uh, insect prone or disease prone areas. Moderate mean temperatures. People generally say 24 to 30 degrees centigrade. I put two degrees lesser here based on my experience that if you can touch 22 to 28 degree mean temperature during, especially during the flowering time and very gentle breeze uh, is very important for this time. And uh, one example I see in rabi season, uh, for example, in Telangana could be one good place. But uh, again, the temperature there, I, I have to check. Uh, this is uh, how good it is. But in the rabi season, I believe uh, it should be between 24 to 30 degrees in that place. And uh, it still counts into a good region. So if you have these conditions, that is the place uh, we should concentrate as policymakers. The second thing, irrigation and drainage facility. Many people talk about irrigation, but nobody talks about drainage. Throughout the world, I really uh, uh, I could not understand this uh, thing. All your fields should have good irrigation at the same time, good drainage facility. So the control of the irrigation is completely in your hand. So when I say one to two centimeter of water initially, it can be maintained. And when I say we have to reduce, remove the water, drain the water, it should remove water. So uh, in the initial at the time of transplanting, you will maintain a thin film of water and then uh, you can increase up to four to five centimeter up to maximum tillering stage. Once you achieve the maximum tillering stage, then you need to drain out the water immediately in order to create cracks in the, uh, in the surface. Cracks mean uh, moist cracks, not wet cracks uh, or wet moist cracks, you can say. So that you can curb on the uh, unproductive tillers. You don't allow the unproductive tillers to uh, take a lot of this nutrition there and become useless at the end. So drain waters and finally again you bring water back and then eventually you will drain at the last uh, step 10 days before harvest you should drain it completely uh, in order to improve the maturation at the uh, setting quickly. Isolation, space isolation is 100 meters from any other rice crops but I told you space isolation I mean totally away from rice crops uh, is best uh, preferred, uh, but then in, in this world, you cannot have a rice crop without rice around. Uh, it's very, very difficult, but try to get as much uh, area and the space isolation uh, into consideration. And if you are going to have uh, time isolation, then that is 21 days. Now it is using uh, GIS tools to predict which uh, ideal locations for two line and three line approaches. And uh, for two line, we have done very good uh, uh, efforts under the two line study group uh, efforts. And those locations have been shared with those groups. But I'm just trying to put out that slide for your, for your sake, how we can detect uh, the hybridized seed production for the Philippines, for example, and what are the locations for self seed multiplication in the Philippines. So for the seed production, the red one is the one which we need to focus on. And this is basically the most uh, best conditions. Uh, and we have for every month, we know which, uh, what is the, uh, that design of the, uh, the color there over hundred years of stable years. And therefore you'll pick the right place and again, zero in which of these has those conditions that I mentioned earlier. Now moving to the next topic is uh, nursery management, layout, seed rate and so on. Uh, the best uh, scenario, if you ask me, uh, what would be the best uh, case of uh, seed uh, that you would like to put? I would go for 10 grams per square meters, but then nobody would do that because they would say, oh, you will have to spend 15 kg means 1,500 square meters of uh, nursery area would be required. And that is not uh, going to help. So we, we try to pick on 20 grams uh, to keep uh, at least to make it reasonable. And therefore, uh, 20 grams is what it is using. And if you can use 10 grams, 
then you will see something like the, the figure out here, you will have very robust tailoring ability early on, and this is what exactly we, we should be doing. Now, seed rate, uh, I mentioned earlier, 15 kg per hectare for A line, 5 kg for R line, or for CMS the same way, 15 kg and B line 5 kg. And you should ensure the seed is of the highest uh, grade, uh, certified, registered, or even foundation seed, or if you are having breeder seed, that's fine, fantastic. The, the fertilizer management in uh, nursery. I think uh, in the nursery condition, you can use all the NPK fertilizer, one kg at the rate of 100, per, uh, 100 square meters uh, plot size, it should be square meters. And uh, the 15 days uh, afterwards, you can put another 21 uh, NPK, uh, uh, 2100, and it could be one kilogram of the same. And in places where you have organic fertilizer, you can put about 250 kilograms for 100 square meters, but it should be well rotten and uh, uh, good quality organic, uh, organic fertilizer. Now, in, in, in the Erie, this is a 20 gram uh, nursery. You can see here, we also get this uh, kind of a nursery at the time of uh, thing. But if you do with 10 grams, it is desirable, but again, the cost has to be seen. Uh, this is uh, another say, situation where the 20 grams is shown. And in the main field management, uh, you need to uh, run the tractors, uh, power tillers, and uh, make sure you get uh, more mechanization is uh, desirable, uh, and make sure you have laser leveled uh, leveling in your field. Make sure uh, eventually you should have a very perfect plane uh, like the one shown here after the puddling is done, everything is done. You should have well laser level feel like this, where uh, the thin film is exactly should be evenly all around. So that uh, that is the kind of water control you should have, and it should be desirable to uh, get the water out of this place as well uh, when you are irrigating and uh, drainage is there. Now, how do you transplant? Uh, there are many ways of transplanting. I will take uh, one which has been very well uh, clearly explained in the uh, in the manual. Uh, and uh, between the A and the R line, the spacing is 30 centimeters, as you can see here, uh, uh, between the A and R line. And uh, the between the uh, A line, uh, it is 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter. Uh, it is kept dense so that they flower at the same time. That's the purpose. If you keep uh, 20 by 20, uh, it will create more tillering and uh, they may not, uh, uh, the high density flowering would not happen and they will not emerge out at the same time. So try to focus uh, to keep it very uh, packed uh, in the sense. And uh, here it is an example of eight rows to two rows, but eventually I told you this is the basic step. So people who have less experience can, can start with eight rows to two row and eventually grow up to 16 rows to two rows as you go along, okay? And then you can have three rows or three times of R planting when you are having a new combination, when you don't know about A and R uh, growth habits in a particular location, you only know the duration of flowering and you have less information on those conditions. So the, the key criteria here is, for example, if an A line is uh, uh, flowering, uh, uh, earlier uh, than uh, the R line, then the the uh, the the thing is that you will plant or ten days earlier uh, if your uh, A line is flowering, then you need to keep the R line uh, first, uh, the second R line, and have a ten day uh, difference between this R and the second A which is planted late in order to synchronize it. This is called growth duration, uh, growth duration, uh, growth uh, duration difference method. I'll come to that later. But uh, again, if it is the other way around, if it is uh, supposed switched off, uh, then you, your A line uh, has uh, flowers, uh, uh, delayed uh, flowering, then you have to do the reverse of this, uh, the same thing. And these R lines have to be uh, planted, uh, R1, R2, R3, should be alternating each other. And that way, uh, uh, you will ensure that always there is a steady supply of the pollen uh, to the plants. And uh, uh, the wind direction should be perpendicular to the, uh, the rows. So rows will be like this in horizontal way. And the, this is perpendicular, the wind direction. 
And this is the same thing I told you, uh, the opposite of this, if the A line uh, is delayed, then the uh, R line flowering by 10 days, then the middle R line, uh, the second sowing of R line should match exactly on the 11th day from the A line sowing. So this way you can match uh, based on the uh, growth uh, differ uh, duration difference. Now, likewise, the A and B also uh, generally, uh, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, this is when both the A and R, for example, A and R are having same time, then you match the A with the R line at the same time. Uh, one, uh, both R lines, one early one and a late uh, sec uh, second sewing, uh, the third sewing of R line, three days interval. So each of these R line should have a three day interval. Okay, that's the point. And uh, the, basically the idea here is to give that pollen uh, cover during the flowering time. That is the purpose. So your A line, basically uh, some pollen coming from here, some pollen coming from here for the A line and some coming here. So if, if this fails, uh, if there is something like earliness, uh, it starts flowering earlier than the predicted time, then the first one will take care of it. Uh, if it is uh, uh, exactly the way it should be flowering, then the middle one will take care of it completely. And the, the, the last one like that. So in order to transplant, plant, there are many ways to do it. And there are a lot of new techniques. So for example, you can have the different uh, planting uh, uh, rods uh, for uh, doing eight rows or two rows or uh, in any design you want, you can make a metal rod like this or with a wooden rod. In Erie, we use a wooden rod like this, uh, kind of uh, with uh, done with plywood, uh, the uh, solid wood, it is done the same way. And you can, after your, uh, 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 puddles condition, you can uh, simply run it over to form the grid and therefore you can easily know uh, where to plant the seedlings exactly uh, based on that. So for example, you can see the grids are there when uh, uh, these are trainees who came from Germany, they are learning to transplant and they can do effortlessly understanding the simple principles of transplanting in a grid. So uh, and anyone can do it at their leisure and uh, this is only to uh, train the people basically uh, in how to utilize this effort. But eventually uh, when you have the row ratio done, uh, then you will have a very beautiful uh, field like this where the flowering uh, uh, would be uh, matching the uh, one and the wind direction uh, is there. Now, for a, beginner, for a beginner, like who doesn't know anything about a, a seed production and you don't need to jump into this situation that oh, I will stop always do with the small scale production plots. Don't do big, uh, large volume of seed to begin with. Do half a hectare or one hectare maximum and learn the technology. And then after experience and uh, training uh, your staff and other people, you slightly increase to 10 is to two. Then you get more command on it. And if you know the A line and R line behavior, whether it can uh, give more pollen load, the R can give more pollen load, how is the behavior of the A-line in receiving the pollen? All this will eventually translate into from 12 is to two to 18 is to two row eventually. But it largely depends on the restorer uh, plant type, uh, the CMS plant type. Uh, the restorers are generally tall in nature and CMS uh, should have the CMS traits. The lemma and telia should open at the right time. The stigma should be exerted out and all those traits should be uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and the restorer should be his outside. Nowadays, the new technologies like these transplanting machines, so people can do is uh, uh, manually plant the uh, R rows, two rows, or if you have a two row seeder uh, can be done, then you can plant with the two row seeder uh, transplanter. But uh, uh, I, I have not come across a two row uh, transplanter so far, but uh, if you can find one, that's great. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can do manually this one and use the uh, uh, machine, uh, transplanter machine for the, uh, the, the eight row or uh, uh, if you have still bigger one, you can use for more number of rows. So eventually your plot would look like this after transplanting and it will grow into like this plot uh, over time. 
And remember that you need to fertilize them and irrigate, as I mentioned earlier. I will come to the fertilizer is as per recommended. And eventually it will start growing like this. And uh, this is where it brings to the fertilizer application. It's always based on uh, proper uh, uh, recommended doses based on soil analysis. And uh, these are again trainees uh, learning how to uh, 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 place uh, fertilizer in the field. And um, uh, in dry season, you need a more quantity of the fertilizer. You have a rice uh, crop manager. You can use rice crop manager to get a recommended dose uh, for any particular location in our geography uh, uh, based on certain questions that uh, the rice manager would give. So you can use that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, based on the, uh, in the Philippines, we use 120 kg of N, 30 kg of P and K, 30. And uh, this is how the basal, uh, basal dose is given. First drop dress and second drop dressing is given uh, at, before transplanting the basal 21 days, uh, the first uh, top dress and second drop dress uh, after 35 days. So again, it depends on the maturity of the parental lines as well. You have to remember that. Uh, and remember the best uh, scenario is if the parental lines are, uh, should be less than a five day difference, uh, less than five day difference between A and R. That is the most ideal type of parental lines to begin with. So if you have something like 10 days, it's not really good because it will behave uh, uh, differently in different places on the temperature and other conditions. So always try to select parental lines that uh, for a given hybrid uh, or uh, whichever successful hybrid with uh, lesser duration differences. And this is for the wet season. And also avoid nitrogenous fertilizer uh, during the panical initiation stage, because this can uh, also trigger the synchronization efforts that we will be doing uh, uh, as we learn this strategy. Now, irrigation scheduling, I told you, we need to keep the water shallow after immediately transplanted. Then you, uh, you wait till the cracks are formed uh, in the surface, just like this cracks, wet, uh, but cracks are formed. That is the time you, uh, 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 that can reduce the tillering of the, at the bottom, you see there is no additional tillers who dry up or they will not form new tillers coming out of it. And in drought area, keep some emergency water use uh, if you are going to run shortage of water, um, ensure your water resources are completely secured till the harvest of the crop. Okay, so then prediction and day, heading date and adjustment. So this is uh, very important here uh, uh, because the prediction of heading date and adjustment methods is very cr crucial in hybrid rice seed production. Uh, and one has to understand uh, what are the uh, stages of uh, flowering. I mentioned earlier the floral plots. Now this is uh, when the panicle initiates, uh, which is which occurs uh, around 60 days for a medium duration variety. And uh, uh, after uh, panicle initiation to flowering, it is about 30 days uh, approximately. And from flowering uh, heading to maturity is another 30 days. So this is how you should time it up. So early duration could uh, bring it like, uh, early one can be like 10 days uh, earlier, by 50 days, uh, panicle initiation, and still early can be up to 45 days. But uh, that depends on what type of hybrid parental lines you are having. Now you have different stages, one, two, three, uh, which is panicle initiation, uh, primordia stage, primary branch primordia, and panicle branch primordia. You just look at the size of the uh, panicle initiation, which is microscopic, you just look at it. 1.5 millimeter or two millimeters up to four stage, you can hardly see it. And it will be very, very smaller than this. Okay, so you can imagine that is the kind of, uh, uh, and you need to have a lens to specifically look at this stage. If you are very sure about this stage, that is the time you can adjust the crop uh, very, very interestingly, I'll come to that. And then the second uh, part is the fourth, fifth, and sixth stage, uh, which is more related with stamen and pistil parimodia formation, pollen mother cell, and meiotic. And the first three stages also very much influenced with uh, temperature conditions and other uh, things. But uh, the, the second one is also very much uh, can be controlled. So these six stages are very much controllable, okay? You can uh, uh, change this timing 
depending on our strategy that we'll be adopting. So 30 days, 27 days, 20. So you can see three, three days or four days difference between each stage. So basically you can shift uh, uh, about three days or four days by one stage jump uh, straight away by adjusting the flowering strategy. So I'll come to that now. So first you have to understand how can we synchronize? Uh, I should have taken this topic earlier, but uh, when we are uh, before seeding and uh, transplanting, but uh, to for the understanding, you need to know these three steps. This is before your nursery even. Okay, so growth duration difference, I told you, which is the most popular, which I told you already, that uh, uh, is depend on the heading date, you have the differences. So not the 50% days of flowering. So heading date should be taken into account. And you should test the parental lines in the target seed production geographies. Not that uh, at Erie, if I do the testing here and I don't do testing in the target production geography, then it will not work. So you should take wherever the variety has to, the parental line has to be tested. You have to test in that situation for one or two years before you can really understand what, what, is the, what happens or how this could be triggered uh, properly uh, and how they, they behave, the stability of their flowering. And then sequential sowing based on whichever uh, is flowering early, the differences uh, should tell which one to be sown early. For example, A line, uh, is uh, uh, late in flowering means you should plant A line first and R line later. If the R line uh, is late, then plant R line first and uh, A line later by the same difference uh, between the growth duration. The second method is uh, leaf number difference. This is very popular and most uh, 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 possible because this is very, very standard. Uh, and people can do it very easily uh, if you just uh, try to measure all the, the leaf of a, uh, during the growth from nursery till the flag leaf emerges out of it. And each day you can measure it, say uh, one, uh, 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 the first leaf comes, the second leaf comes. So if the second leaf comes or third leaf comes and the third leaf is uh, half the size of the second leaf, then you will say 2.5. If it is, so, Depending on the scale of 1 to 10, you can put it at 1.7, 1.8, depending on the amount, length of the leaf in relation to the previous leaf fully emerged out. So therefore, two, for example, uh, for a flag leaf to emerge was 16.8 for uh, 25A uh, uh, and uh, 15, sorry, uh, 55R for 16.8 and 25A was 15.2. The difference is 1.6 uh, leaf difference. Then you have to wait uh, uh, till uh, the the 25 a, the uh, 25 a uh, reaches 1.6 uh, leaf. Uh, and then only you sow this one. That is as simple as that. Okay. Likewise, you can do the effective accumulated temperature. It is a very simple formula. Uh, don't get scared. It's a sigma. Uh, the, the sum of the mean temperature, the higher temperature than 30 and lower temperature than 12. If you can have the summation on the days on each of the, uh, from the sowing till the uh, flowering time, the heading date, uh, then this is very, very specific for all the varieties. Always it requires that much mean temperature to achieve uh, flowering. So using this simple principle, for example, an A-line takes 1450 degree, 1450 degree centigrade to flower, and 1350 for our line, the difference is 100 degree. To wait uh, 100 degree centigrade to be accumulated, which would be around four days, for example, to sow the A line. So that is how uh, you can match this. So this is uh, maybe difficult, but, to, but I would suggest this is also good, and the second one also good. Uh, of course, when uh, for beginners, this is okay. first one. So let us uh, look at this criteria, uh, how to get a good synchronization. So from the panicle initiation to the flowering or the heading is the key to uh, key to success is how well, best you can synchronize the A and R line, okay? So R should flower first, then the A line, uh, 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 so that it initiates the uh, something like uh, some cover for it. So a very good flowering synchrony would be like this kind of a scenario. 
I have removed the flag leaf in both the situation. That's why it looks very uh, uh, looking good uh, to see only panicles. Now, the anthesis cover is three designs. Okay? So when I said beginners can do three sewings of R line, basically to give a very good cover of the A line in the middle, to give a first cover, second cover, and a third cover. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it gives a very good cover for the A line. Okay. Likewise, if you have two uh, R line, it can also go do a good job. So with moderate experience, you can have uh, two R swing. But eventually, when you have pr profound experience and you know how to exploit R line, uh, that is where I said 10 grams per square meter. So to make the R lines very, very robust, then you can even attempt this one. So this is exactly uh, your rich experience will eventually lead to this one sewing of R line and one A line. And uh, it can be very, very productive and save on the cost. That's the purpose. Uh, prediction of flowering dates of uh, CMS line. Uh, okay, one thing I forgot to tell you, when you have R lines of different uh, flowering, there are some tricks around it also. Like you can pull out the nurseries all at the same time, or you can pull out at different times and plant it, and you will incur more cost. But you can do some cost saving by pulling all the three together, and then uh, layer by layer, you can lay over each other, and then uh, have a random uh, sampling so that you can get equal proportion of all the three seedlings, and you can randomly plant it. So those are tricks around it. But uh, uh, if you have a structured in the uh, in the field properly, one up, one followed with the next is also good. So prediction of flowering dates of CMS line and R line. The, the prediction of flowering date is basically is in eight critical stages. The regular I, I didn't mention the last two stages because that's not much concern to us. The first eight stages is good enough. The regular examination of panicle initiation should start at thirtieth day. People should go to the field, the technicians, the researchers who are handling the seed production field, they, uh, the big guys, they should be in the front, pick the primary tiller. And now uh, identifying primary tiller, many people say, I know the primary tiller, very easy to spot out. Uh, just pull out the best flag, uh, tallest flag leaf by holding the plant. No, that's not the way. The, it is one of the way. So you hold the, grasp the plant together and look at the tallest uh, leaf and try to pull uh, hold that flag leaf and then look for a point uh, which has the highest point called junctura. So junctura is a point where it will show a ridge is there at the, at the, at the end of that uh, leaf. You will see there is a mark there. That if it is higher, that is the primary tiller. And the one which is having a slightly lower than that, they are the secondary tillers, okay? So to identify primary tiller is very key. Sometimes people pick the primary tiller, uh, secondary tiller, and take the panical initiation, which is a bit uh, slow, and try to uh, create the adjustment. That is wrong. Okay. So the key is to identify the right primary tiller and then make the adjustments. Okay. So this is very important to understand. That is why the practical classes are very important. Unfortunately, we don't have a practical session here, but that's why I'm trying to orally tell you this particular point. And then use a magnifying lens to look at it. Just by your visual eye, you can't make it anything, okay? So first three stages are very small and you will miss the, the purpose of uh, opening the tiller, uh, the, uh, cutting open the, the tiller and looking at the, prime, uh, the panicle initiation. The, and it leads a lot of experience. People with uh, good nails, uh, people have a thumbnail, they use it as a razor to cut it. Good experienced people will do that. Okay, otherwise you will have to have a, 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 a slight small razor with you attached with your toolkit and you should do with the magnifying lens as well. R line should be one stage earlier than A line. I showed you that uh, in the just uh, one stage earlier. Remember one stage, that is three days maximum. And in the first three stages. So in the first three stages, the R line and then uh, A and R should be same stages in the middle. And A line should be slightly earlier than the R line in the last two stages. Okay, so but the at the time of heading, it is always preferred that uh, the R comes out first uh, than the A line because if you are uh, new to this whole thing, uh, there could be a possibility that you'll miss the 
uh, the R line pollen uh, cover. So in the beginners uh, should do, uh, make sure the R comes first, okay? This is in those cases, but I'm talking here is the middle stage of uh, R here, okay? So the flowering time adjustment are very interesting. If you use nitrogenous fertilizers, you can delay the flowering. If you use phosphatic fertilizers, you can enhance the flowering. This is the simple principle, okay? Now you can use uh, also potassium. Uh, some people would say that, but uh, these are proven ones. Uh, there are many ways to do that, but uh, experience again comes here in uh, good, uh, good as you go along. Then water also can uh, delay our line growth. So you can control the uh, irrigation that will delay the flowering uh, uh, by reducing the water. And A line is not sensitive to water, uh, 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 the flowering. So it doesn't, uh, it's not sensitive, but R is sensitive because it's going to give pollen grains. So that's why it is sensitive. Just remember that. Partially damaging the rice plant. For example, if R line is uh, going very fast, then uh, we can slightly give a, a stamp on the root region by your foot. That's a trick they play. So you go near, walk near to the, uh, the R line rows in between of that and uh, press your foot very deeply to cut the roots by your foot. Just by uh, heavy foot, you go there. Uh, that itself will uh, trigger the uh, reduction in the speed, okay? And other technique is give a flag, uh, uh, flag leaf cutting also. So that also uh, can uh, help, okay? So delay the flow. Cut uh, two uh, early panicles. Suppose the, the thing is going very fast then you're controlled the panicles emerge and you are in a very big situation, then the best thing is to cut the panicle, early panicles and uh, see, uh, give uh, fertilizer according to match the other parental line. If the uh, parental line needs, uh, the other parental line is very close by, then you need to give more fertilizer to, uh, especially phosphatic fertilizer to enhance the speed of flowering, okay? And uh, likewise, using the fertilizer. Growth hormone, again, uh, very important, GA, triplic acid, this is also can uh, increase the, uh, uh, it also promotes the uh, growth as well as the flowering, okay? So you have to remember GA is not only a hormone that helps in the flowering, but also very important uh, for other uh, uses also. I'll come to that later. So case one, if the trouble is found in the first three stages, uh, earlier parent should be applied quick release urea and uh, delay the development. The second uh, is, the later one should be sprayed 1% solution of DAP by doing such a measure, uh, diammonium phosphate. DAP means diammonium phosphate. Uh, by doing so, you can create a difference, uh, can cover a measure of four to five days, can be adjusted. Second case, ANR can be, uh, if there is a difference of 10 days, then remove the panicles of the earlier one and apply the nitrogenous fertilizer in the form of urea or spray the urea. Uh, uh, which, gets, which gets absorbed very quickly, and it makes more late uh, emerging panicles and unproductive tillers bear panicles to, uh, to get the synchrony. Third scenario is like a more dangerous scenario. If the, during the flowering stage, the blooming time is found not to synchronize. Usually R is flowering earlier than A line, for example. Uh, improve the micro environment in the field by drainage, and uh, also, if there is dew drops on the A line, in mostly in the temperate conditions, this is a phenomena. You'll see some dew drops. Uh, try to uh, remove those drops by gently uh, moving a stick around in the morning and to give a shake so that the dew drops fall off and it becomes a micro environment for it uh, to correct that. And then spray cold water to the R line. So this is a, a way. If you have a source of cold water from a a well uh, could be a very good way to do that. So this needs like a high speed uh, jet from a distance with a tube you can give a good spray. Uh, floral, uh, flowering synchronization strategy. So best way, uh, best foot forward is like this. Flowering synchronization strategy is like to study the parental line growth features in the target production geographies is the most essential step and people should spend more time before jumping into commercial production. Newly released hybrids, it is good to have two to three times sowing of our lines to secure flowering synchrony, but as you go along, two is best. One is absolutely best, but that needs most experience, at least four or five years before you can jump into that situation. 
applying more fertilizers for the R line in the seed bed so that the, you get more robust R uh, seedlings. So uh, you can increase the R line. These are tricks again. So this depends on not only getting uh, multiple uh, tiller in the early seedling stage, but to create more robust seedlings, you can do more fertilizer, especially urea fertilizer can be more. Uh, and then planting the uh, A-line uh, with a higher density. That's what I said, 15 by 15 centimeter and uh, more densely planted uh, could have a uniform heading of the panicles and they will form like a layer of panicles at same time emerging. Fix the seed production area, grow should accumulate experiences for good synchrony. So based on the experience, you should bring other growers and uh, have a, a discussion around what are the best synchrony experiences and uh, table it out and so that you don't repeat the same mistakes that you did in the past. Uh, the flag leaf tipping is a very important step, especially it uh, increases the absorption of the gibberellic acid one way. Also, uh, it adds the more synergistic uh, value to the gibberellic acid. So uh, though it is, uh, increases the cost of production, but uh, we came out with a new technique uh, at Erie, we used a flag uh, leaf clipper, uh, which is a hedge cutter basically, and anyone can get, and this is a very robust tool. We introduced this four or five years back. And uh, I, I, I really recommend you to get this equipment. Uh, and uh, this can do, uh, one guy can do uh, one hectare or two hectares very comfortably. Uh, and you don't need a sickle, a sickle cell, a sickle uh, approach like the one, the, it's very tiresome. A lot of labor is involved. To reduce the labor is the best approach. It costs very less in the in the uh, uh, online shopping uh, places. Then we go to gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid is very essential and very important uh, for the uh, for its role and what are the advantages. I will list them out very quickly. So uh, you can use a knapsack sprayer, or you can use an ultra low volume sprayer, or other uh, approaches. I'll talk to that later. But in the beginning, like in this uh, flag leaf has been clipped. Uh, you can see how nicely it has been clipped. And uh, when it is 10% uh, uh, flowering, uh, heading of 10% uh, panicles, that is the time gibberellic acid should be sprayed on the seed parent. Remember that. This is very, very fundamental of using gibberellic acid. If the flowering has come out much, then there is no use. Uh, more delay, more no use of gibberellic acid. The, the value of gibberellic acid falls short. And then it improves the panicle and stigma exertion. Panicle height of the uh, seed parent also increases along with this uh, uh, pollen parent. And the growth of tillers increasing the effective tillers, the uh, uniform panicle layer, you can see how beautiful one layer of panicles are seen. Flag leaf length is uh, flag leaf angle uh, increases. The thousand grain weight is increases, unfilled grains uh, reduced, uh, increases significantly seed setting, and the yields are highly uh, effective. The higher the dose uh, the of gibberellic acid, more it is good. To our understanding, our research, 400 grams of gibberellic acid, way, way, very high, is very good, but the economics would not permit us. Again, uh, uh, up to 100 grams uh, is also desirable uh, in uh, where you can't afford for it or the uh, availability is uh, hindrance. So we at ERI follow 200 grams per hectare. So uh, at a gibberellic acid with a knapsack sprayer and ultra low volume, you need only half of it. So that is why you need to use ultra low volume. Uh, the benefit is the same. So the first spray, five to 10%, uh, heading, suppose you do in the afternoon, the next day morning, you can do when it is about 20% to 30% heading, that's the best time or the second day following day. And you can uh, split it 40% to 60%. So 40% is given on the first day and 60% is to be given on the second day. Now more splits can be helpful, but again, the cost of, uh, cost of production will increase. So if you are using drone, and other approaches, then you can have three doses of or uh, more splits would enhance 
the uh, seed production or seed reproducibility. Remember one thing, you need to dissolve this in 25 milliliters of alcohol one day before, so that uh, for every gram uh, in 70% alcohol, you need to also use surfactant to allow the adherence of the gibberellic acid to the surface of the leaf or the place where you are hitting. So your, uh, your, uh, your uh, nozzle should aim at the inflorescence uh, place so that it is more effectively utilized. Uh, also make sure your gibberellic purity is 90%. Uh, or, uh, and do not purchase 100%, that is not useful. 90 is cheaper and very useful. I put a, a list of market uh, in India. Uh, you can uh, shop in any online market. I'm not recommending any of those ones I've shown here, nor Erie is linked with any one of these things to recommend this uh, listed here. So this is only to show you a price scale. Now, uh, when I was a student of, uh, I did my PhD in hybridize in, 1990, uh, uh, that time, uh, the gibberellic acid was very expensive and not available in the market even. And uh, we used to get few packets from China, somebody traveling to China, somebody would come and bring us some few packets of few grams of, uh, and they will be very elated to use them. Or oh, we are used gibberellic acid. That used to be our research in 1990s early. Now you see the one kg of uh, is only, I saw even lesser than this money. So. 10,000 rupees per kg. So you can have liquid version, you can have powder version, whatever version you can, but you need to do some research and find out what is best. But higher doses is the best. More number of applications is very good. Uh, so uh, what type of uh, technology you are using, it all depends on that. So basically in US, uh, they use uh, uh, planes, aeroplanes like this one, uh, uh, where gibberellic acid is uh, uh, sprayed like this, or an unmanned aerial helicopter would do like this. And this is by Rice Tech. Uh, I had borrowed this slide from Dr. Mao. Uh, and uh, this uh, reduces the time cost. And basically, it's how best you can use these equipment is basically to reduce cost and time, uh, basically, on the labor. Okay, that's the point. So when we try to use, we, we are thinking of using the uh, uh, ultra low volume sprayer for uh, drone version of this. Unfortunately, I have not yet got hold of this one, but we got uh, uh, for seed uh, distributor. This is a seed distributor uh, drone that we purchased uh, at Erie, uh, but we can use it for supplementary pollination as well. So if you have this type of equipment that can help a lot. Coming to the, uh, the next topic is of tripping. Now, people may wonder what is tripping is. Tripping means uh, supplementary pollination. When you jerk, give a jerk, you trip. So that's the uh, word tripping comes from. You can trip it by a rope or a bamboo or a supplementary pollination by uh, drones, helicopters, so many things. So uh, the first one here in the picture here is a rope being, being pulled in very big production plots in China. Here another uh, uh, in China with the bamboo stick. Uh, the person is holding in the middle and shakes the, rigorously the R line. And uh, this is one guy with uh, like a robo having two small sticks of bamboo, shaking both rows of R lines simultaneously. Uh, this is like uh, more manpower and more labor uh, because you have to bend a lot to do that. Uh, but we introduced at Erie the air blower. Uh, so this is a handheld air blower. It's very effective. I will recommend people to buy this equipment, which is very cheap. Uh, again, uh, this can do a lot of work. Uh, we can do eight to 10 rounds of supplementary pollination. And uh, in 10 minutes time, uh, interval time uh, between these 10 rounds, between 9.30 to 11.30 or even extend up to 12, if you think that the pollen is still available, even some, in some places, sometimes the pollen is available even in the afternoon for certain parents. So don't just observe the up to what time your pollen uh, load is available and the receptivity of this female to receive the pollen is the key criteria uh, when to when you need to do. And uh, in US, uh, another very interesting from Rice Tech, you can imagine they have 500 hectares of seed production in one place, uh, big plots, very contiguous plots, they have R rows, uh, which you see the light yellow in color. These are R bands, they call bands. So these bands would be like 20 rows of R line or even more. 
and uh, this may be more than 40, 50 rows of uh, R line. So these rows, uh, these helicopters move uh, over the R lines and they can run um, like uh, 16 helicopter in, uh, in 500 hectares can finish the job in a day. You can imagine, can we do this with uh, human labor, with uh, rope pulling or drone or anything like that? I doubt very much. So this is the technology uh, we, we should be adopting wherever it's possible. Uh, these are very small helicopters, not the traditional helicopters. So if you have very big plots, no wire uh, poles or big things safe to fly, uh, go for it. Uh, roguing is the key and essential thing that uh, needs to be uh, understood and should be. Many of the people will forget the short uh, dwarf uh, ropes. That's why this picture has been put here particularly. And sometimes these flowering uh, grain type also should be observed uh, so that uh, you know whether and look open the spikelet to confirm whether it's fertile or sterile uh, helps a lot in roving. So some people uh, do a cut at the bottom. Uh, they use a sickle cell to cut it. Uh, some people will uh, pull it out along with the roots. Uh, both ways are okay, but if you are sure your uh, return will not come back quickly, then pulling this one is better because in 15 days interval, they will come back and it will even produce panicles. So if you are roguing timing is very important. If you are roguing very early on, then cutting has no value. Pulling out is very important. If you are going to cut it at a later end, cutting is okay if you are, it is already about to flower. Uh, so uh, again, the flowering, you have to check and the lower dwarf, so look out for dwarf one. People look for tall ones and they say, oh, there's a rogue out there and you can spot it. But if you have a dwarf one, it is not noticed. So people, the technicians should go inside the pop, into the population carefully of the A lines or the R lines and see if anything is outside the rows, like if it is outside the row uh, or short ones or dwarf ones sitting inside the rows or uh, look at the bottom uh, for the color pigments and other things and uh, plant height, uh, shape of the flag leaf and other things. All these things can be taken and you are all expert, uh, have good expertise as, as students and uh, uh, oh, my throat is running dry. Let me take a photo. Johar, you have half an hour uh, before we have a hard stop. Okay. So uh, I'm just uh, cruising in. Let me see if I can pull it off. Uh, so disease and pest, I will not be discussing, but we'll be trying to attempt the similar manner as we do for an in inbred rice cultivation. ERI has a rice doctor uh, website uh, in the Rice Knowledge Bank. People can download this app into your mobile and make best use of it and uh, follow chemical control as a, uh, because this is a seed production plot, the uh, losses will be enormous. So immediately go for the chemical control whenever you find any trouble. The seed uh, harvesting is uh, very important and uh, equipments again is very important. This is a winter tiger machine out here at Erie, uh, which does a very good job for threshing, a stationary thresher uh, taken into the field. You need to harvest the, uh, the materials. Uh, first, the R line should be harvested as you can see, the R lines has been removed and put taken into bags, uh, net bags, uh, so that the aeration is there. Don't take into uh, sealed bags, otherwise, Due to moisture, they can destroy the germination of those things and do not delay threshing. Immediately go for drying uh, and then go for threshing and all those things. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in this case, you see water here, but there should be no water at all. 10 days before the harvest, it should be dry. Okay. So, first R line should be harvested and then A line. They should be separately harvested and roguing should be done on the A line and R line before harvest, and it should be clean, uh, uh, completely clean uh, for roguing. Uh, and the, in the seed storage and marketing and processing, a uh, lot of good machines are there uh, that can help you. Drying uh, is a very important uh, aspect, uh, and uh, you need to dry the seed sample less than 12%. Uh, percent. Uh, you should avoid any admixture during the threshing process, uh, by other seed. So always keep a particular threshing machine for a particular combination to be, otherwise you need to clean it up every time. So you have a different processes, drying, cleaning, grading, sanitation, packaging, and storage. I think many of you are from the company, so I don't need to illustrate this 
more to you, but I think more of you would be very much aware of this, how we can do. So uh, drying machines uh, should be used, uh, use moisture meter every time to verify the, uh, the moisture content and also uh, uniform drying so that better germination storage. A lot of big machines are available in the world. Uh, try to use best machines for air drying, seed drying, and uh, make sure uh, then you also grading machines are there. You can remove all uh, empty and partially filled uh, based on their uh, gravity, based on the things they can be graded. Uh, also remove the germinated, pre-germinated seeds by chance, discolored uh, seeds by laser color sorter. At ERI, we have all these machines uh, which we use. Also, you can use a fungicide for micro fertilizer coating or seed coating can be done. Uh, so here is a color sorting machine that ERI has. Uh, which does a very clean job. If you have two or three processor in it, it will absolutely, it can done tons of seed in no time in a day. So one can buy this type of color sorting machines uh, to do for a paddy. People use it for uh, milled grains, but we have designed it for paddy as well. Uh, seed storage uh, is very important. Uh, we can use hermetically stored seeds in storage. Likewise, uh, uh, low moisture content, dry conditions is very important. The storage conditions should be free from uh, fire threat, uh, birds, rodents, dehumidifiers should be there. All these things should be very, very essential for us. Organize the storage in uh, separate areas uh, for different uh, hybrids uh, with different batch sizes. Uh, uh, within the storage also you need uh, places. Okay, this hybrid combination should be kept separate. Seed sanitation is very important. Uh, and uh, the seeds could be stored in cold uh, st storage uh, places in order to, if you are to uh, distribute for the next season. Seed quality control uh, is very essential. Uh, we have uh, standards all over the world for seed quality and make you have to adhere to this, follow the rules carefully. Strict isolation space, number of rogings, uh, purification, uh, seed certification guidelines are very important. Adopt them, modernize seed quality, purity testing. Seeds should be tax uh, should be uh, taxable to the original law, uh, traceable, not taxable. <laughs> My goodness, uh, this is a mistake. So it should be traceable. Uh, it should be traceable to the original lot uh, and uh, location by tracking system. So we should have uh, uh, a method by which we can uh, track this. And uh, the the seed quality is important because it has a direct consequence on your uh, the farmer seed. Uh, that he will get and the seed producer seed impact. So also, it also impacts the farmer who's cultivating the hybrid rice itself. Affects the seed quality, viability, germination percentage, uh, rates, all this can be uh, if the quality is not controlled. Uh, it can also, you can avoid the seed borne diseases, insect pests. Also, it will increase your seed costs, uh, uh, production costs uh, at the same time. Uh, it will be parental line seeds as it will affect the F1 seeds and, and uh, yield and quality. Also the brand and uh, honor of a given company, also it will be at stake. So seed marketing, I, I, I did not elaborate this guys. Most of the private sector are very good in it. Uh, ERI is no good in seed marketing, but we can give you good tips here. Uh, have very healthy relationship, uh, good friendship with your customers, those guys have multi-location demonstrations, organize frequently uh, field days, bring the farmers to your hybrids, uh, show them, leverage extensive, uh, extensive extension and marketing teams, uh, uh, leverage their expertise, good sales services after post sales service, very important. Uh, and then uh, seed uh, production insurance coverage, also, uh, also very helpful because the first time people should not get into trouble. So uh, insurance cover by the company or by the seed grower should take, uh, should have it in order to safeguard them. Production on intellectual properties such as brand, payment of royalties for licenses on time uh, is very important because uh, that is how diligence is uh, built upon. Uh, seed certification standards are there uh, for the different R line and A line and F1 is there are very well uh, there and guidelines are there. What should be the purity percentage for a breeder seed is always 100% for a breeder foundation seed and registered seed. 
and uh, for uh, the A by R should be uh, very high uh, again. Uh, in, in, this is in the Philippines and uh, especially in the first 15 days and then off types uh, in the maximum tillering flowering stage. And likewise, before harvest, uh, you can imagine like one in uh, thousand or one in uh, should be only seen. So that is how it is seen. So uh, in India, the standards are likewise uh, is there for hybrids is 200 uh, meters for isolation for certified 100 meters for A by B 500 meters. And uh, the purity percentage uh, is 98 for foundation certified seed. Uh, I think it should be 98.9, uh, I think. Uh, off seed, uh, again, 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.2. So these are their pollen shedding panicles in uh, should be 0.05%. So objectional weeds uh, and all those things. So likewise, this is in China. I will not repeat it, same thing, but the emphasis is it should be 100% in breeder seed and slightly less in. This is the tag that is available, different colors like breeder seed in, uh, these are canceled and not to be circulated around. Uh, so uh, this is a breeder seed tag for uh, India and uh, for foundation seed white and blue uh, and different color codes in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, we have molecular uh, markers for genetic purity testing and uh, genetic purity testing, uh, you should have a cycle, rolling cycle model. Uh, always keep in mind at the fifth year, many of the seed production plots would be very poor if you are using the same seed source. So always build a new seed source for uh, your uh, lines. When the lines reach fifth year, you should have uh, material already with you with the third year and another one in the first year. So, so that always the new seed is replaced uh, for A by B, especially for A by B and eventually A by R. So these are the markers that we have. Of uh, three markers you can see for RF and uh, CMS marker. These are very important for uh, making sure your uh, genetic purity is under control. Uh, we have also thousand F1 markers, uh, thousand uh, SNP markers, RECA markers. Uh, which have different versions and we have uh, purity SNP markers of 22 markers, which can be used uh, for purity testing. Also grow out test uh, can be uh, done, which can also tell you how many purity percentage you can put a grade like this and uh, get into it. Also you can have uh, SSR markers or other markers can be used for taking bulk samples uh, of row bulk and column bulk, and then mark the spots where the specific uh, percentages you can evaluate on the based on row bulk and column bulk. It will point to the exact point which seed was impure. And likewise, uh, the um, markers that you can uh, uh, in the SSR markers like 337 and 154 has been uh, shown by uh, Sundaram uh, et al, uh, who is currently the director of IIR in India. So uh, this paper is uh, good. You can use these markers if you are using SSR markers. Economics of the hybridized seed production uh, is very important. And uh, uh, we have uh, seen that there is a, uh, the production cost comes to $1,394. Uh, this is a work done by Nirmala in India of IAR, from whom I have taken this slide. Uh, and uh, this also a slide from her. You can see uh, this is in the districts of Telangana where the hybrid cost uh, of F1 is 2.5 tons, uh, seed uh, price of uh, 1 1.09 given to the farmers. When you say price here is the seed grower that is given and the value, uh, the, the total value of the hybrid rice is $2,700. Uh, that, uh, that emerges out of this uh, sale. Uh, the, that is uh, the, the, the the value of the hybrid rice based on the uh, price and the uh, R line, you get something. So eventually uh, by taking into account of all the values, including the straw value, uh, the total uh, returns is $3,000. Now, if you have the input cost 1,394 and gross returns uh, 3,000, your net return is 1.6, your benefit to cost ratio is $2.17 per hectare which is very good. In the Philippines, uh, you can touch it up to uh, uh, around uh, $1,800. Uh, 
And in other countries, uh, like in China, it's very low, uh, the only $800 because of the cost of labor. So uh, I tried to, uh, this is a, a slide I borrowed from and improved upon Dr. Janaya, uh, where these two were mentioned by him earlier. And I added this one, where the current uh, yield level is 2.5 tons and then uh, 0.56 uh, production cost and 1.3 uh, price that is being given by the, to the far, uh, to the grower seed grower, and currently when I saw the price was like seven to seven point five dollars. So the companies are making a good number amount of profit, but not translating it to the growers. Uh, key points, uh, salient points. This would be my last part of the top topic. I'll go very rapidly here because uh, all of uh, it's only revision here. So more than two point five ton is the key thing. Touch cross three tons is our benchmark. Uh, uh, decrease the input cost for seed production, that's the key. Uh, need to reduce and avoid losses, enhance seed production management. This is very important, the management part. Uh, and then how to seed inc increase the seed yield, uh, have the best outcrossing rates in your parental lines. So that is the key to uh, increase the seed. That's why ERI is sharing almost uh, 16 new uh, CMS lines. Many of them have very high outcrossing, more than uh, uh, the 25A. If 25A is 25%, we have already introduced 35 to 45% outcrossing rate with higher combining ability. Uh, the uh, the carry out uh, seed production in the last season, best season, and ideal location. Uh, I mentioned it: agronomic field management, achieving good synchrony, use higher doses of GA, effective supplement, supplementary pollination, uh, use uh, better drones and other bigger equipments uh, at, in order to cut down on the cost. Uh, strictly control disease and uh, insect pest. How to reduce big avoid or big losses. So production side, post harvest and storage. So avoid poor and no synchronization is the key. Uh, at any cost, you should not end up there. And harvest to matured uh, seeds in, in a timely manner. Many people forget this and rains uh, come in that time when something happens. Post harvest and seed processing is another very important uh, topic. Uh, no mechanical uh, mixture should happen no seed damage during drying process. People should not leave it in the drying floor or machine or uh, for long periods. And the fumigation needs to be done. Uh, and also make sure it is uniformly the, the seed is dried up. And also the storage, the temperature and the uh, moisture content is under control. How to control, uh, improve seed production management. Strictly train your seed growers. Make them do the heavy task very in a professional way. Uh, also, standard operating protocols should be followed. Quality control at every step uh, is very important. Proper deployment of labor force at every step for seed production. Field-oriented managers or technicians need to go to the field. That is the key. If you don't step your uh, people, their foot onto the ground, nothing can be achieved. I tell you, uh, entering into the field is the only thing and guiding the key uh, staff under you. So, to sum it up, uh, what uh, could be done eventually is you need to have a scientific expertise, those countries where uh, scientific expertise is not available, increase your technical manpower drastically by training, training, training. Infrastructure and government support is very, very crucial. Uh, it will not come from thin air, any money. So uh, government has to invest in the beginning. Eventually it will become like a, a fruit bearing tree. Once the tree bears its fruit, it will churn out money for any, any government to start with. Hybridized seed production is very important uh, uh, and uh, to uh, uh, should be increased to reduce the production cost and to make it income. So for example, if you are two tons, if you make it three tons, you are going to increase one more fold of one third of your uh, cost reduction would be there. So if you are one ton to two tons, you are just, you see how big the differences it is. So that is how, uh, the three-ton mark is very important. Multidisciplinary teams are very important uh, from uh, breeders, agronomists, molecular breeders, all should be teamed up. So in one rice breeding at ERI, uh, we have done this and we have a very strong public-private public -private partnership. ERI Tech Transfer is there, which is backing it up. So we have all the elements here, just adopt our own model that we are following here. Maybe it will help for people who are uh, less experienced. And farmer support services is very important. People should have some place where people get all the things in one roof and cheaper and uh, uh, credits are given and at lower costs, uh, government should equip them. This is a 
uh, a food security task and everybody should uh, uh, give support and policy is policy support should be very very important especially uh, to create the skill based seed production hub just like telangana seed hub so we should create more such hubs in the country in india and bangladesh and uh, uh, nepal and other countries and uh, that is our direction so with this uh, uh, here are a lot of uh, references i leave this uh, slide with you guys uh, it will be shared to all of you later and this uh, presentation as well so no need to worry and take uh, uh, these things and uh, there's a book i uh, published in 2021 which gives uh, two chapters on one chapter on hybridize and one on uh, two line hybridize seed production so you can have updates on that directly and uh, currently 64000 downloads so you uh, and and uh, that was the 60th year of eri that was uh, dedicated so with this i like to thank uh, hans uh, met premier ramao uh, singhutwel uh, nirmala for their slides basically Uh, some of the slides i borrowed from them marco for arranging this uh, fantastic uh, webinar uh, hrdc advisory committee members uh, linga anna pauline tini and my entire team especially i'd like to mention adrian roy who also helped me to prepare some of the slides and photographs uh, and he's the person who is doing the seed production for hybridized team at iri and we have a many big team also Pauline, Tini, Lolit, Magdo, Senan, Dito, Kaloy, Eric, Anna, Christian, Dona, Michael, Mark, Carla, Meet, Alexi, No, Ray, Roman, all of them, I think. And thank you very much. Ah, oh, I thought, and that was fifteen minutes a, late. <laughs> we have a large number of questions, which we will probably not, uh, most likely. Yeah, yeah. Not to handle because ladies and gentlemen we have unfortunately we have a hard stop at the hour so uh, if you don't mind uh, jahar while you have a a drink and a little rest i will pick a couple of the questions and uh, what we will do with the other questions we will collect them and we will send them to jahar and uh, i'm sure that he will find other ways to answer those questions jahar uh, there's a number of question that ask uh, uh, about basmati rice hybrids so uh, are there any and what's the status can you talk a bit about that okay so the basmati hybrid is uh, uh, was developed by iari in india uh, uh, indian agriculture research institute called as pusa rh10 that's a very glaring example where grain yield and quality were combined it was 40% more than yielder than the regular basmati variety so pusa basmati one so uh, it combines the yield as well as the grain quality features of the basmati so uh, in a way uh, the the purpose of putting that slide is to show that uh, when you have both parental lines you can have a hybrid of your choice and in this case the pusa rh10 parental lines were having the basmati grade parental lines that is why it ended up getting basmati hybrid so that's the principle behind it so you can create any any hybrid of your choice uh, for example samba mashuri your both the grain quality should be like samba mashuri if you can achieve that while keeping the genetic pools distinctive only the grain quality features similar to samba mashuri you can create samba mashuri hybrid so this is the technique Uh, we are adopted already, and we are addressing the market needs. And very soon, we'll create many of these combinations uh, at our mill. Yeah. Thanks, Jahar. Um, I see that a number of people are using the raise hand function. Unfortunately, due to the time pressure and due to the high number of people, we will not be able to do this. So, if you have questions, please use the Q and A function. One of the questions, uh, Jahar, that might be particularly uh, useful for you to answer is from Amar Afkami Gadi and he asks thank you very much for your presentation why in some countries such as Iran is hybrid rice not successful okay so the the now in Iran when i was there <laughs> it was there we released uh, six hy one hybrid and six were in the pipeline hybrids so it is always investment from the government so up till the, when i was there it was an open ended uh, uh, opportunity i was leading their uh, hybridize program from iri sitting there in uh, rasht but unfortunately 
the government after I left, uh, uh, the, the follow through was not there. I had a, a very good book written on it and given this to the uh, policymakers. Even now, if anybody reads the last page of that, it has all the uh, reasons why, uh, what is your uh, basic reason why we should be doing hybridized in Iran is very important because your geographical area for seed production uh, for your uh, rice cultivation cannot be increased. And when the food need comes, the only way is to go for uh, a hybrid technology. We produced a very good hybrid uh, like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the first hybrid, uh, 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 IRH, Iran rice hybrid one, uh, it was named and yeah, that was the name. Okay, there is also, there have been several people that are asking whether they can receive uh, certificates. Uh, please note that what we will do is we will send each uh, participant, each attending participant an email confirming your participation. So that will act as the certificate. Then we have somebody who is asking, uh, what is the future production perspective of two-line hybrids in Indian conditions? Okay, the prospects of two-line hybrid. I think uh, we uh, we formed in 2020, uh, 2020 uh, we formed the two-line study group uh, with uh, five top companies. I will not uh, spell out their names here, but these companies came forward to Erie and said, we will finance this uh, work in a very strong manner. And they funded us uh, by paying $100,000 per year funding for three years. And with that fund, we started doing very aggressive breeding program on two line. And the, some of the key uh, uh, findings was that we wanted to take this entire technology to the ground and validate with the, uh, uh, in the country, uh, in this case, India. And uh, it has already been validated and uh, we have very good results with us. And therefore it doesn't make me any uh, less confident that I, I see that in next two years or so, this will become a uh, reality in India because we produced one, CMS, one TGMS line that uh, becomes completely sterile at 24 degrees centigrade. Uh, that is where it, it gives me the confidence. And we have many such uh, TGMS lines developed in the, in the coming uh, days. And, and uh, the hybrids coming from two line is very, very heterotic compared to three line. So, so we have a very big uh, uh, doors opened. The production cost comes down by half because only one seed production cycle is required. One is just like in bread cultivation in cooler temperature. So uh, this is all, this, all these things has been confirmed and validated. So it is not talking in air. Now we are talking with substance air. So therefore we are very confident this is going to work. Thank Talk you. Can, yeah. Let's go to the next question. Um, during climate change conditions, as we are all aware of, how does hybrid seed production become beneficial? So I think that the real crux of the question is, could you give us your thoughts about the relationship between uh, hybrid rice and climate change? Yeah, so uh, the climate change is bound to happen. That is very sure. It's nothing not uh, spoken by me or somebody, but the climate, uh, uh, the uh, panel for climate change, uh, IPCC uh, is there, international panel, which has very clearly said that climate change is going to occur. And you will see the biggest uh, changes happening in Bangladesh, uh, uh, in the deltaic regions of India, Bangladesh, Ayurvedi Delta, where the seawater inundation will take place by as early as 2028 even. So this uh, is going to happen. Now, how prepared are the governments? We don't know. People still think nothing will happen to them. Uh, so it is it's a relaxed approach. So hybrid rice on that say, when the unit area would get reduced, what would be the best option? Uh, for example, one third of the Bangladesh is underwater. Now you have to remaining two thirds is there. What crop you will grow in that case, in that scenario to feed the population of Bangladesh, for example. So you need to produce one third will be gone. So the only option that will be left out is hybrid technology. So this is what uh, hybrid technology offers. Apart from being uh, bringing the climate change resilient traits into the background of those hybrids, 
uh, would be the second step. So uh, where it would be drought tolerant, uh, flooding tolerant, or salinity tolerant. So all those features, when it is combined, it gives a good solution for the farmers as well as the policymakers to have their defenses ready. Okay, thank you. We have several questions from Jinyang Zhang, and I will pick one, and uh, that is, uh, for our lines, the nuclear genes are RTRF, with the cytoplasmatic gene being N or normal. If N is altered or transformed to be S, what would happen? There should be no differences in terms of restoring fertility, at least. Am I correct? Yeah, what can edit the gene uh, in uh, CMS in uh, any line? The N can be uh, edited to a sterile line. That's possible. It's not any line can be converted. Oh, so that's okay. possible. But the, it is genome edited. Remember, if okay. you can otherwise by mutation breeding. We have or a huge questions left. So let's go quickly go and try to uh, to answer a couple more. Um, how many back crosses are needed to make a uniform hybrid rice is asked by Saif Ula. How many back crosses? Uh, I, I didn't get the question. There, uh, the, uh, the back crosses are done only to maintain uh, the A line, which you A into B you cross. We don't call it as a back cross. We say it's, it's a maintenance cross. You are just maintaining the uh, this male sterility to get the seed of the male sterile seed parent. So uh, you are not doing any crossing. So already all these materials are ready. A, B, and R is already in your hand in the required format. And oh. uh, for if you are going to transfer into a CMS line, you need uh, three to four back crosses, uh, but two back crosses with molecular markers is sufficient. Okay, then. Um... Do we have uh, a question uh, about uh, hybrid rice technology in Bangladesh? Um, Raiz Ahmad wants to know uh, what the current status of hybrid rice technology in Bangladesh is and what are the challenges for further scale up? And could you also give your idea about policy measures that could help accelerate the pace? Yeah, so I had, uh, uh, had explained the very important aspect of climate change, one third of them. That's the biggest uh, thing one policymaker should understand very clearly right away. That the unit, a, the productivity per unit area when land is limited is the best alternative is, or the best solution is hybrid technology among all the available technologies currently available in hand. You can do mechanization, you can do some agronomic tree, agronomy, agronomical measures, which can only tweak 5% maximum. But here is a technology which can, tweak, which can push uh, up to 25 to 30%. That is the key. So if that is understood well, the next step is what hybrids, how to improve the parental lines, how much should we invest into parental breeding, how to uh, get uh, in co close collaboration with ERI to get the right uh, uh, pro projects in order to focus the, uh, approaches where, like in Nepal, has uh, come to Iri with uh, in a big way to ensure that their food is secured through hybrid technology. Similar way, I think Bangladesh should look into this uh, option. I, I would uh, really encourage that if that is done uh, similar to the model of Nepal, it would be fantastic. We will see that uh, uh, no stone is unturned to achieve the best of the best uh, for food security. Thank you for that. Uh... Johar. Unfortunately, we have come to three to the top of the hour, which is a hard stop because we have a another event straight after this. I would like to thank Johar for his eminent presentation. I would like to thank all of our attendees for taking the time to listen to us. I would also like to make sure that you understand that we will not ignore your questions. We have collected all of them and we will send them to Jauhar and his team, and I'm sure that they will do their best to answer them to the best of their knowledge and abilities, which I can assure you is considerable. So thank you everybody for attending. Uh, uh, Marco, let me make one uh, announcement here. Uh, the number one is uh, that the people will be able to get a certificate, those who are attending, uh, uh, teenies at it, uh, those who are attended it and registered it properly, they will get it on email. 
not a print version, but a online version. The second thing is uh, all your questions would be sent to me as Marco said, uh, and uh, because of the uh, loss of time here, so uh, the lack of time here, so we will be able to answer them and send you to, because we have your email IDs, so we'll send uh, uh, personal uh, answers to each one of you, uh, whosoever asks those questions. So thank you very much, Marco, for arranging this. Thank you very much. And thank you all of you. Okay, bye-bye everybody.